Hello, everyone, and welcome to GovGeeks Assemble. Level up your nine to five on 95. I'm Javier, and today I'm excited to share a guest with you. I had the chance to see a presentation that she had done a couple of weeks ago that was just phenomenal. I mean, her amount of energy and enthusiasm for public service was just it was great. Everyone in the, in the audience was just like really engaged and really kind of drawn in with this energy, especially also on the important subjects that she was talking about as well. So let me go ahead and read Brittany Carter's bio for you guys. She is an enthusiast, as we'll see here shortly, uh, for creating customer centric and equitable experiences for the residents of King County in Washington State. As a research analyst, she manages the customer experience out of the Office of Performance, Strategy, and Budget, where she's also responsible for scaling and deployment of customer service metrics and service design created on and centered on creating more customer focused culture in county government. That was a lot for me to say. I don't know, Brittany, did I get too much my my words a little garbled? <laughs> no, that was great. That was perfect. <laughs> well, it, it's amazing. Like some of your experiences that you've had, you have published a CX measurement guidebook. And I guess uh, CX is customer experience. Mm -hmm. And you've implemented a standard framework for measurement of insights that's now currently being used in the design of the King County Customer Service Center. How does it feel to have like such a big impact? Um, I, I, I don't even see it as a big impact, Javier. Like I, I think for me, it's just making sure that we are making good decisions with the voices of those that are going to be impacted and um, often that's our customers that we are that we regulate to come to us being a government entity so it's making sure that since we are telling them to come to us to complete things and we are the only person the only entity that they can go to then those experiences need to be positively impactful and easy and equitable for those that we um, serve Absolutely. Positive, easy, equitable. Definitely. I, I mean, when you think about government services and having an equitable distribution of government services and access for people in government and the public, that, that makes total sense. And you know what? Honestly, I got so excited reading the bio and just like jumping in. I didn't even say welcome to the show. <laughs> <laughs> here i am just like running off and everything okay let's get into the meat of it <laughs> get right in it <laughs> oh my gosh well yeah i mean the presentation for the government performance institute was again fantastic i had the chance to to see everything there uh, i'm curious for you like what sort of uh experiences did you have like putting that together or or participating in all the panels that you're in yeah oh my goodness so i love the performance summit i think um it's just so energizing to be able to be around other government folks and see what they're see and hear what they're doing and i think we all kind of take pieces of the innovations that our colleagues have done and find ways to implement them and so i'm still kind of like taking a breath and taking it all in and um, still going through some presentations and saying, hey, well, you know, what can we do here? But um, it's just, it's amazing. It is incredibly energizing. And I just feel so fortunate to be able to be one of the speakers this year. Absolutely. I mean, again, the subject that you were talking about was just so important. Can you tell us a little bit about how you've been able to manage that within King County and how this is something that perhaps government could really take more of a responsibility for? Yeah, so I think equity, particularly in government, is really important, right? Um, you know, thinking about I always play in my head government for the people of the people by the people right and so what does that exactly mean and I think that's why customer experience is so important to me because it really is that's the heart of a customer experience or CX it's getting the people that are going to be impacted by the decisions to the table 
bringing their voices in and really allowing them to lead this work. I see government as a facilitator um, in the guidance of the discussion and the execution of the delivery of whether it's a product or a policy um, or a service, but uh, the community and our residents should really be bringing those voices to the table. And that means that we have to be very intentional about the design that we're setting up as a government entity and whatever we're doing um, and making sure that the representation is there. We're looking at, you know, the, the spread of race, ethnicity, gender identity, age, uh, disability identity, and making sure that all of these groups um, are part of that conversation because they're going to have very different stories, very different experiences, and very different voices. And it's up to us as the government entity to listen and make sure that our services are meeting their needs. Well, absolutely. Yeah, I, I mean, just being being able to offer the services in a way that are meaningful for the people that we're providing services for in the first place. Exactly. Uh, I mean, it, it makes total sense. Uh, I can imagine that there, there might be a, a challenge in terms of trying to listen to every perspective before being able to make a very thorough decision. Do you feel that that sometimes kind of like slows processes down or how do you find it's best to get everyone engaged and provide services in a quick and effective uh, manner as well as an equitable manner? Yeah, intentionality. I think when we think of a fast process, equity is one of the first things that ends up going out the window because mm -hmm. we um, either the, the parties at the table aren't as educated in the in in the impacts of equity and considering equity. And so then it might be seen the most daunting. And so then it also seems like to be the first that can go. Um, and then I also think of particularly around customer experience, but when we think about equity in, in government, we often look at the data down the line to decide what groups are being disproportionately impacted. For example, if we look at a line of service and or service being provided, and the data tells us that those with a limited English proficiency are having a hard time completing that task, I think that's great information because we can then start doing things like focus groups or community listening sessions to figure out how we can make that process better. And equity should start before the data analysis, right? It's equity is in, um, equity considerations are the moment you decide to, to start to do something, whether it's a policy implementation or it's how you design a service, it's in the plan that you put together, it's in the team whose voices are part of that plan, um, it's in the community feedback that's part of, the, a part of the design process, it's in the questions you are deciding to ask in your survey, right? So when we, when we look at equity, when we look at the analysis of it, and we look at it, the impact down the line, that's great. We're able to really you know, facilitate some positive change. And if we are, and if that's our only stop, then we're always going to see problems, right? But if we start at the beginning, before the design of anything, before we put together a group, we start thinking about who needs to be at the table, what groups are going to be impacted by this. That is a way that we are able to start that equity process and that equity impact um, and, and unpacking that and understanding it and making it part of the way we work. When you think about timelines and you think of things going fast or slow, it's whatever you've built into the timeline that has from the beginning that will determine if what's going faster and slow. You build equity in, then you can give projects and stay on track. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like having a, a firm effort in terms of intentionality to train, inform, and educate everyone up front so that there's more of a need for them to include it because they are they know it and it, yeah. they're aware of it rather than thinking, oh, now we need to do additional steps. Well, no, it's, it's built into the process. So it's not like anything is being slowed down because everything is already integrated from start to finish anyhow. Exactly. And you're going to, and, and I think also you either are going to do that intentionally and see the fruits of your labor through the process, or you're going to hear about it down the line when it's already oh, exactly. impacting people in a negative way. So and it's, that, it's where do you want that that's more time? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Do you want to like do something and then have to go back later on and then address it and fix it and have to worry about, you know, the eroding uh, comfort that people have and confidence in public service in general, mm -hmm. or do you want to get it right the first time and really celebrate the success with everyone along the way? Exactly. Ah, uh, yeah, it, it makes it makes total sense. You know, it's interesting because the the reason why I'd ask the question just in terms of, you know, whether or not in terms of timeline process is this going to potentially be something that slows something down. Yeah, it, it just seems like that would be one of the more um, prominent questions that a person not thoroughly understanding things up front 
may ask. <laughs> yes. yes, it's so true. I think that's one of the things that we go through um, often. And I actually w led an equity analysis for our work group and for our office in determining how we incorp can incorporate equity more in the work that we're doing. And that was one of the things that came up pretty consistently is how do we do it in a timely manner? And we build it in from the beginning. <laughs> That, that's the smart way of doing it. And then that's, again, why I guess you've published the CX Measurement Guidebook. But I, I think you've also done uh, another one as well. And, you know, looking at your LinkedIn profile and uh, information materials that you're sharing as well, Power in the Customer Experience, How King County Used Dynamics 365 and Power BI to Build a CX Program. Is it Power BI or Power BI? BI. Mm -hmm. There you go. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Shows how much I know, gosh. <laughs> but yeah, you know, I, I think what's so cool about what you're doing is it's not just advocating for something in a way that is very passive. You're creating tools and methodologies for people to really engage with the subject so that this way they can integrate it right from the very beginning, rather than like, you know, throwing phone stones at the process uh, of what's happening later on, rather than actually getting it right the first time. I think that's pretty cool. Thank you. Yeah, I look at it as, you know, and and the work that, that I've been a, able to do with the guidebook and, and the, the Microsoft talk, it's a culmination of a lot of um, hands and feet. And um, I get the opportunity to kind of talk about what was what's being done, but there are a lot of people and moving parts behind all of this work that um, are are very integral to the process. And I say that because there's been a lot of learning that I've had that I've been able to do and to, to develop in, and that really is the the bones behind why I wanted to make sure that we were able to publish this guidance document in this guidebook. Um, because I was able to uh, take others and learn and talk to different people to be able to facilitate and standardize the way that we collect information. And so I look at it as I can feed one or I can feed a thousand, right? So if I can do that with just the work that I've been doing and make that work available for others to then within our organization and outside of our organization to be able to replicate that work or make it better is my hope, right? Um, then and that 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 that's the that's the greatest impact, and I just feel so fortunate um, to uh, you know have folks that are also supporting me and making sure that this this is a great body of work and that we're moving it forward. Yeah, and in that regard, it, it almost seems like it's not just you doing one thing, but it's you informing, influencing, and engaging others for them to do it. And like a ripple, it just continues to, to move down until like there's this bigger wave of change. Yeah. Uh, what are some of the bigger impacts that you've seen as a result of uh, your approach? Yeah, I think really it's it's shifting the customer, shifting um, the mindset of the business into centering the customer needs. I think often when we think of, you know, if we are going through big changes or we're implementing a new service, we often think about, okay, what does the business need to be successful and what do employees need to be successful? Um, and that's those are great questions and necessary questions. And so I just really challenge folks to think about, okay, what does the customer need? need to be able to complete this goal to complete this task in their and you know in the in the process of their goal and once you're able to start thinking like that and centering the customer and their needs then you can really start to be innovative about the responses that the business is doing um and you know and so i've been a part of a lot of those discussions and i'm finding lately that i'm in the room and other people are asking those questions and that's when wow. i know my work is done right? <laughs> i don't need cool. to be in this room anymore other people are asking those questions and really centering the customer because I think those that serve in public sector are there to serve and right. it's not really very it's not a hard sell to uh, to help people facilitate understanding centering the customer it's just giving them the tools of course and then I guess also it's having the ability to upfront decide okay and define who is the customer mm -hmm. I mean who is this being designed for because if there is this one assumption or this idea about with whom they're trying to create the designs or for whom, 
then they're inadvertently going to miss people as well. So if you have the intentionality to help really listen and identify, then it, it just sounds like good project management in general, because if you know the needs of the customer and the stakeholders and you design the programs and the solutions to meet their needs, then obviously it's more effective. But if you just take the time to get it right at the first, <laughs> right at the beginning. Yeah, and I think that's a lot of work that we do around customer empathy mapping and customer journey mapping, where we really try to understand who that customer is, what are they trying to do, especially in government, we are not the goal, right? The goal is not to get a vehicle registration. The goal is not to get a permit. You know, the goal really is to build a house or to go on a boat and spend that time with your grandkids this summer. That's the goal. We are just a, a step, a task in the completion of that goal. And so that really, you know, when we are able to look at that and we're able to prioritize understanding how that customer feels during that process and who that customer is, then that becomes more, makes it more human. And yeah. then we are able to make, keep that human centered design in the middle of all of it when we're, we're building something new or changing a process. Well, even that tool, customer empathy mapping. Yeah. I, I mean, if we were to think in government, just like all levels, all across, if they were doing customer empathy mapping up front, uh, how much better were the programs? How would they be designed? Yeah. Um, honestly, I, I haven't recalled uh, hearing customer empathy mapping before. So yeah. it, it's like, it sounds something, it sounds like something that's so innovative. And yet it is still so standard and basic to the function of what government is. Yeah. And it's so important. It's so, you know, and it's a pretty easy process. Um, and it's a really great chance to center equity. You, when you center a customer and you say, okay, well, this customer, um, you know, has a limited English proficiency or their preferred language is Somali, right? What, we know that's one of the, one of the, our, our major languages here in King County. What does it look like for somebody um, who's, you know, who uses Somali to be able to navigate that journey, right? So it's just really centering every, what does it look like for a mom with three kids or a parent with three kids to come in and complete their vehicle vessel registration? Do you have coloring books? You know, I have a one and four year old. I, I can't, I wouldn't be able to take them to do a lot of the things that I need to do, um, you know, that, that encourages interaction with government. So it's just really centering and understanding who your customers are, just as you had said, and empathy mapping is a great way to do that. Of course. I mean, if we were to think about like different models, I mean, if there's a business approach and they want to have the end goal of the customer to come in to do X, Y, Z sort of an activity or purchase something, they have different means of managing the customer needs to facilitate that end goal. And I guess, you know, like the goal isn't for them to get their driver's license. It's for them to be able to be empowered, to take care of their family, to go to work or those sorts of things. So when those concepts are built into it and you're addressing their needs up front for how you can facilitate that, then those items and those topics are just like, yeah, that totally makes sense. You're asking the right questions at the right time. Yeah, looking so, at the whole person. A whole person. I like that. <laughs> Who would have thought the whole person? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, in terms of like your, your career growth and your development, because I think we, you and I can talk about the importance of equity, <laughs> public can. service, how we provide that for a long time. But for the folks out there that are watching, that are listening, I'm curious, like for you, um, what has been some of your hardest won career lessons? I think for me is that you can't solve every need, right? Um, I'm in public service because my heart is for people. And um, I think particularly in, in public, you know, in, in public sector and in customer experience and the work that we're doing with human centered design, I really wanna be able to solve every need and have an answer for every body and every person. And um, I think the hardest challenge is that that's that's a slow process, right? You have to piece by piece and chunk by chunk. And I am definitely by nature in a, a visionary 
I want to do the biggest, best thing. Um, and I want to do it now. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, um, and so I think that the challenge for me is knowing, you know, that there are needs to fill and I still have to choose which goes first. And the only thing I can do is make sure that the, the, the process by which we choose is an equitable process and trust in that. Um, and so that that's kind of one of the challenges. And then also kind of navigating, um, you know, government organizations and understanding the impacts that you choose in one area. If we do something for parks, um, public health is going to have a very different need, right? So just being able to manage the needs of my customers and the departments um, to make sure that everyone is getting uh, the appropriate resources necessary to make sure that they can then serve their customers. Exactly. Yeah. And being able to understand the, the partnership that's there, but what a what a very hard won lesson that that is because you want to be able to do so much and I think that that's one of the bigger things that public servants uh, across all levels of government experience because they have a genuine interest and a passion for what they're doing that's why they're there and to recognize that you're not able to do everything all at once or that sometimes it takes more bites at the apple in order for you to get towards that end result. Yeah, absolutely. Ah, so uh, in, in terms of the career path that you've taken then, uh, clearly you're very enthusiastic and empowered. Um, who are some folks along the way that have been able to help influence you in your growth and empower you to be able to, to do these many wonderful things? Yeah, I don't, I think, I don't think it's any one individual. I really think it's a collection of, you know, others, my own and others experiences when working with or interacting with a government entity and interacting with the, with, um, you know, the public sector, really it's the, the policy decisions have impacted and influenced my work. Um, there's been you know, a lot of work to be done and we need many hands, many views, many voices. And so over time, really I've been inspired and influenced by many people. And my heart is to really let people know that government is people like me showing up and trying to make things better for everyone. Um, even if that means that it's not better for me individually right away, but it, it, but it inspires better and more innovative processes for a larger group of people then I still think that, that that's definitely a win. So I think really thinking through what's influenced me to work in government, it's really just being, um, you know, seeing the impacts that it has down the line and working hand in hand with some really cool people that inspire the work to be done and are showing up every day, waking up every day and saying, I'm still gonna be here and do this and do it with my whole heart. Um, and so I think that's been a really influencing, influential process and understanding, you know, and seeing the impacts in my community of policy decisions, good, good and bad, um, and, and what that means. And that encourages me. And I look at my one-year-old and my four-year-old and my nieces and my nephews, and, you know, I want it to be better for them. Whatever the it is, there's a lot of it's, but I want it to be better for them. And... I feel like I can lay down at the end of my life and know, you know, I did what I was supposed to do. I did the best that I could do to make this a better place for my babies and their babies. Oh, that, 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 that gets me right in the field. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it really does. Because really at, at the end of the day, uh, gosh, I mean, can we allow ourselves to rest or to sleep knowing that we did what we thought was important? And that we actually made a difference right. or was it you know you dedicating so much time missing birthdays and all that stuff towards something that really doesn't matter as much in, in the long run but knowing that you've made the world a better place for others uh that that's just it's very very empowering and i'm curious um for all of the folks that are out there that are watching and listening and everything um if you were going to impart some wisdom to help them be able to feel comfortable doing that or to make that a reality for themselves. What does that look like for you? What would you say for them? 
Yeah, I think being open to change and trying new things. I think government needs that more now than ever. Um, whether it's big or small, small bold moves can have large impacts just as big bold moves can have impacts and challenging the status quo. I think in government, we often kind of, it's easy to fall back on. That's just kind of how it always has been. Right. And so challenging that status quo is the only way we're able to innovate, inspire change. And so I think those that are coming into government, that are interested in government, being open and open to change and trying new things. But I would challenge those that are in it to be be open to change and try new things. I think those that are coming in, I've had the pleasure of working with, they're ready. They're innovative. They are thinking. They're on their toes. They're asking those great questions. And it's up to those that are currently in it, those that are in leadership and have the positional authority to be open to change and trying things. And even if it makes you a little bit uncomfortable, then we should be, we should be trying and doing new things all of the time. That is super cool. <laughs> I feel inspired by that. I think that's really awesome. good. <laughs> so for, for folks out there who might be interested in reaching out to Brittany, of course, uh, she's available on LinkedIn. Feel free to see all of the cool content that she posts there as well. Uh, the video that we were talking about earlier is, is right here as well. So feel free <laughs> to click on that. Give her a big thumbs up and follow and all of that great stuff for the hard work that she's doing there. Brittany, honestly, thank you so much for your willingness to help government perform in a way that is best for the people that it serves. I, I find it very inspiring, and I'm really thankful that you've taken the time to chat with the GovGeekdom today. It's been a pleasure. It's been a great experience, and I'm just to feel so lucky that I was able to share what I've learned. <laughs> that is awesome. Everyone, thank you so much for watching, for listening. We really appreciate your engagement. We appreciate your public service and uh, everything that you're doing to make the world a better place, like how Brittany is doing as well. Thank you so much. We look forward to seeing you next time. And again, thank you for your service. Take care.